All right, All right. thank you very much to the organizers for uh, the invitation to speak here. Uh, so the story I want to tell you about today starts in the faraway land of machine learning research with a paper of P. Uh, e, we, Oliver and Poznikov. Um, and so they were doing the following thing. They would take some kind of number theoretic object, for example, a number field or an elliptic curve, and then would take some kind of limited amount of data about this object, feed it into a machine learning algorithm, and uh, based on that limited data, try to figure out various invariants of this object. So for example, they would take a number field, uh, feed, the, feed the number of uh, idealism about a norm in this number field and try to guess, say, the class number, things like that. Um, and in the case of elliptic curves, the idea was to take a limited number of Frobenius traces. So take a sub piece uh, at primes up to some parameter t and try to use this kind of information to figure out uh, the rank of the curve for a curve, say. Now, of course, we expect to be able to do such a thing uh, based on, say, BSD heuristics. Uh, and they were trying to see what they can say in this situation. So more precisely, uh, yeah, and out of their paper came the following observation, uh, which will be the basis of my talk. So let, let's take E to be the set of elliptic curves over Q. Um, with conductor in an interval in ring R. Then the observation that they made was that if we take all the curves uh, in this family and we take the P Frobenius trace, uh, A, E, and we average this over the family, so divide by the size, uh, then their observation was that this, this is an interesting function. Um, and now I want to show you a couple of pictures. Try to, is this on? Great. Um, all right, so picture number one. So what are we looking at here? So here, um, the, the, we have a blue curve and a red curve, which you can see kind of complement each other. Um, and these, these are all the curves in um, for the conductor in a certain interval split by rank. So the, the blue curve is rank one curves. The red curve, I think, is uh, rank zero curves. And here- Other way around. Other way around, okay. Uh, one and zero. Um, and here, the two curves correspond to taking rank uh, zero and rank two. Uh, so if, as you can see, when you plot this, oh yeah, and on this axis, uh, this is the prime P. So we're interested in that quantity as a function of the prime P when P ranges um, in, a, in, a, in a certain interval as well. Uh, so you can see that this function has this very unexpected oscillating behavior uh, and that the direction of the oscillation depends on whether you, P, uh, whether you pick even or odd rank. Any questions? Yeah. This range of uh, n, does it uh, change the behavior? What is the range of uh, conductor in this picture? Uh, does it speak for prime p or does this? So this is just a picture for a specific range. And I think the prime going up to the bottom of the range. So here, let's say p is up to n1. Uh, but this is just one picture. There's no variation happening here. We're fixing a range. They picked some like random range, you know, 8,000 to 12,000. Uh -huh. uh, and they drew this picture as a function of P. Okay. So we can ask. Yeah. Uh, the dots here, are these just individual elliptic curve or is it just as it's already there? Uh, so, so each dot corresponds to the value of this average. Uh, and it is plot. So the this the, the x-axis here is the value of p, 
And then a blue dot corresponds to um, this value of the average for an even rank, and uh, a red dot corresponds to an odd rank. Any more questions? Okay, great. Uh, so now this would have been the end of this, but uh, Sutherland saw this paper and pushed these computations much, much further. So there's a couple of key features that came out of Sutherland's computations. And I'm not going to go into too much detail about them now because I should take this moment to advertise that there's going to be another talk on this where uh, Yuri will present his computations, uh, which will discuss the sort of features that I'll be talking about in much more detail. And it's tomorrow when? Four o'clock. Four o'clock. OK, so be here at four o'clock if you want to know more about this. Um, but the couple of features that are relevant for what I will be talking about are the following. So first of all, uh, this is truly a phenomenon that comes from root number as opposed to rank. So rank here is just a proxy for the root number. So we want to split by root number. Um, and also, it turns out that the correct sort of interval to consider is a geometric one instead of an additive one. So we want to take an interval of the form n comma some multiple events, so let's say n to n to be concrete, and look at primes up to n. Now, if you do this, an amazing thing comes out, uh, which I'm going to call scale invariance. Um, and let me show you what I mean by that. So these two pictures have different values of n. The, the, the bottom point of the interval n, and we're taking dyadic intervals. So in the top picture, we're taking uh, a dyadic interval starting at 2 to the 12, and here an interval starting at uh, 2 to the 17. Um, and in both pictures, on the scale, I have the prime p going up to the starting point of this interval. So p is going up to n. And if you look at this, you can see that when you rescale like this, this basically becomes the same function. So this thing at the top and this thing at the bottom look suspiciously similar. Oh yeah, and I should say here again, uh, that is uh, root number uh, one and this is root number one. Okay, so this scale invariance means that secretly we want to think of this as a function of E divided by N uh, instead of a function depending on P and N. And under this rescaling, uh, we can see that this becomes more and more and more sort of pronounced and convert and seems to converge to something concrete. Okay, the, the third feature. When you say root number, you mean the sign of the function? Huh? Yeah, the sign of the function. Um, so contextually, the parity of the rank. Right, exactly. Um, yeah, exactly. So the third feature is that this is something that deeply depends on this ordering by conductor. So if we try to do essentially anything else, order by naive height, pulsing height, anything else, uh, then nothing works. This is, this is what happens, just white noise. Uh, so this is a feature that, that deeply depends on this very subtle ordering. Um, and that perhaps might lead you to the line of thinking that this is actually not just uh, an observation about elliptic curves, but this is a more general phenomenon that happens with modular forms. And let me make this concrete so we can take a function m of e comma capital M which is this average, average over, again, conductor in a dyadic interval. And then average over new forms. Uh, 
um, let's say new forms with root number one, a f of p, and I guess normalize it divided by the number of f's. Um, and then in this setting, we will also have a very nice picture. So here I have a bunch of pictures. Um, elliptic curves correspond in the modular, let's say weight two modular form uh, setting to uh, modular forms with Yau orbit of size one. That is what we have at the top. Uh, but then we can look, also look at um, forms with Yau orbit of size two, three, et cetera. And uh, in each of these cases, we get this nice picture. But then finally, when we put them all together, there's this very, very concrete you now function that has no seeming, uh, no like fuzziness like we saw in the previous pictures, it's just a continuous function. Um, and the subject of my talk is going to be this function. So I'm not going to address the general setting of, or, or the preliminary setting of the first discovered setting of elliptic curves and lower uh, degree orbit things. But in this particular case, when we take all of them together, it turns out that we can actually write down this function um, and prove the convergence to this function as the bottom of the interval goes to infinity. So, okay. so what I'm going to prove. So, one of my last slides is going to be the theorem because I didn't want to write it down. This terrible function, but <laughs> theorem. This is the function. Uh, so it start out. It starts off very nicely. Uh, it starts out, oh, and this alpha, beta, gamma are constants. They're like one point something. They're all pretty comparable size. So it starts off as a very nice piecewise, I guess, algebraic function, something times root y minus something times y. And then when you cross over the one fourth point, more annoying things start to appear. There's this like arc sign, there's another arc sign, but the upshot is that you can write it down. Great. And just to convince you that I'm not uh, lying to you, here's a graph of this function. It looks quite similar. Um, great. Now, actually, it turns out that the reason this function looks so ugly is that there is, I would argue, a more natural function to look at, which is sort of like the local version of this function. So here in the, in, in the setup that I described to you, we were averaging this quantity over all forms in a dyadic interval. Uh, and it turns out that if instead uh, you take a short interval, so like an interval over the form x, x plus something, where the something is much less than x, uh, then you get a much nicer looking function. And once you have this function, you can recover this dyadic picture. And this is what I'm going to talk about today. So, okay, so theorem one was the dyadic. Theorem two. It's independent of weight. Uh, let's, let's just do weight two. Uh, so theorem two. Um, let P be a prime going to infinity with X. Uh, and let Y equal to P over X be bounded by log X, um, where Y some parameter that is less than some power of x and more than some other power of x. Here, these constants are all very concrete, but you should think of y as being like you know, x to 4 over 5. So it's some power saving interval that is not too short. Um, so then the following theorem holds. So if we take all the forms, uh, all the square free levels averaged over this interval, over the short interval, and we take all the new forms of the square free level. Well, first of all, how many things are we adding together? We have roughly y up to constant levels, and for each of them, we have roughly x up to a constant form. So it's something of size xy. So here we normalize by the xy. Uh, take Take, take the sum a f of p times the root number. Um, then this will converge 
of a function. Now, okay, so in this case, the function is arguably slightly nicer looking. Uh, it's just a sum of a bunch of square roots. And the coefficients of these square roots are kind of finicky, but we can write them down explicitly and we can plot this function. So I just want to point out that when I was talking about dyadic intervals, my prime p was only going up to the bottom of the interval, but here I can let p go up to x log x. So when x goes to infinity, this becomes a function on all of r, all of r plus. Uh, and then you can plot this function, and I will talk a little bit more about this function in the end, um, but for the next, for the next part of my talk, I want to explain to you how to get to a result like this. Uh, yeah, some magic's gonna happen. So can I just ask you to speculate a bit about this relation? Like yeah. Passing from a little curve to modular forms. Um, suppose you did this over a quadratic field. Would you expect the same over a real quadratic field and over an imaginary quadratic field? For four elliptic curves. Ah. Um, I don't know. Did you ever compute yeah. compare the computation? Yeah, I'll say a little bit about this tomorrow. Um, I think the answer to your particular question is probably yes, but there there are variations depending on the end of what this is algebra of here. But is there a distinction depending on whether you work on a real or an imaginary quadratic field? I haven't looked at that specifically. Um, Okay. Um, okay, before I proceed, let me mention um, that there is existing work on a similar kind of question that has been done by uh, Kimball Martin. Um, and his result treats the quote unquote P equals one case of this question. So if, if, you, if you just take all the new forms, uh, If you just look at the root number uh, not correlated with a sub p, then it's a theorem of Kimball Martin that, that there's always going to be an excess of root number plus one forms compared to minus one forms. And this is going to be an excess of size um, square root n. And then another theorem of Martin and Paris, hope I'm pronouncing this right, uh, deals with the case of fixing just one level n, so not doing any averaging. Uh, and in that case, there's also already a bias. The sum of epsilon f equal to a fixed epsilon over f. Uh, is there's there's also going to be this is going to be of size again and in fact this as as, as we'll see from our proof as well uh, this excess is actually expressible on the nose as a certain class number okay now for the proof. Sorry, would you have the same qualitative sort of thing if you were summing over mass forms in a, instead of some fixed eigenvalue value? I don't think so. I don't, I don't see it at least at the top of my head, but perhaps. You have to normalize things properly. That's, uh, you are, he asked about weight. Yeah. I think the thing has to be size square root B. The multi, so AFP would be too big by itself. So you divide by P to the K yeah. uh, minus K one minus two over minus two. two yeah. mm -hmm. uh, Drew does that in his calculation. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so the main idea of this proof is to use a trace formula. And the reason we can hope to use this, the trace formula is because the sum is new k of n of a f of p epsilon f is actually on the nose equal to up to a sign uh, to the trace on the space of the p pack operator involved with the accumulator operator. And now that we have this expressible as a trace, well, we can see what we, we can we can see what this trace is equal to and hope that when we average over a bunch of levels, there's some cancellation, which is exactly what happens. So this trace has been previously computed um, originally by Yamauchi, uh, but there was some calculation error in that paper, so which was later corrected, corrected by Skarupa and Zagie. Uh, which calculates this trace uh, with this trace by unfolding what happens in the Selberg trace formula in this case. And it turns out that for n square free and p not dividing n, there's a very nice expression for this trace, which is that is equal to one half. Not dividing. Huh? Yeah. So this trace is, turns out, is just expressible as a sum of a bunch of class numbers, uh, minus this, uh, what will be the main term, minus p plus one. Um, okay, so here I should say h one is the Hurwitz class number. Which is basically the same as the class number, except uh, instead of counting primitive binary quadratic forms up to SL2 Z equivalents, we're counting all of them together. Um, and they're also weighted by the size of the automorphism group. So up to up to some small constant, H1 of D is going to be the sum of F squared dividing D of the normal class number of D divided by F squared. So we're sort of taking all the primitive forms from all the um, for all the for all the discriminants d over f squared, and we're putting them all together. Great. Um, okay. So yeah, and here I should point out that the sum is over parameters s going up to four pn. So we always want the entry to be a negative discriminant, and we also want n to divide s. So in particular, for example, if you imagine fixing p and n getting larger and larger, then there's actually only going to be one term in here uh, fixed asymptotically one term. And this term is going to be a class number, so it's going to be like something h of minus 4pn. Uh, and using class number bounds, you can already see this excess from just this formula. Um, it's going to be of size square root. Okay. But we are interested in the prime p growing uh, and potentially growing to be larger than n. So this formula is going to asymptotically, as, y, as p over n goes to infinity, have more and more terms. And we're going to have to deal with all of them at the same time. Uh, Okay, so what kind of terms we'll have? We'll have h of, okay, so first we have h of minus 4pn. And because we're restricting ourselves to n square free, this is essentially, this is very easy to deal with uh, in the sense of divisibility. So this is just going to be h of minus pn plus 
hf minus 4pn. But then for every k plus n2 root p over n, uh, we're also going to have h of k squared n squared minus 4pn. And here, as you can imagine, this thing can now be arbitrarily decomposable, like you can have arbitrarily many square factors. So this is going to be lots of terms. Capital H is the same as your H1. They're yeah, capital H1 and H1. Sorry. Capital H and H1 are the same. All right. Let me just discuss. First, let me discuss the easy case of these two summons. It turns out they're rather easy to deal with. So, yeah, uh, and just to be clear, the idea of this calculation is to now take these class numbers and to hope that we have enough of a handle on class numbers taken over an interval uh, for the sum to cancel out an average and to converge to something very, very concrete. Uh, because we do have for various bounds for these class numbers that they have to be of size square square d up to an epsilon, but that on its own is uh, not even nearly strong enough to give us this asymptotic behavior. Great. Proposition one. So let x, y, and p be as in the theorem. So recall that y was a short, quote unquote, short interval, and the prime p was bounded in terms of x, not too, not too giant in terms of x. Then the sum, this normalized sum of n in x, x plus y, square free um, of h of minus pn is equal to a constant uh, times root p over x, which is recall our parameter y that we're formulating everything in terms of, plus big O of x to a negative power. So we can get a pretty good, a pretty good handle on, uh, yeah, and this, and this constant C is given by some Euler product. So it's going to be like pi theta of two times some product over primes of something ugly. Some, 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 some density defining. All right, proof. So the idea behind this proof is that uh, we can use the class number formula. And because we're averaging over an interval, we can hope that there will be a lot of cancellation in the class number formula. So for, for minus pn, minus pn equals to uh, one mod four, or zero mod four, but this can't happen in our case. Um, H of minus Pn is going to be equal to uh, root Pn over five times a value at one of a certain L function. And the idea is now to do the following, say that, say that this term over a, short, over a short interval is sufficiently well, well controlled, essentially doesn't change. And in this term, we get a lot of cancellation. Okay. Oh yeah, and I should tell you what this L function is. So chi, uh, <coughs> chi x of e one alpha one, a alpha k is a product of characters where so this is a chronic character. So for, for, for all the odd primes, this is just gonna be given by the usual Legendre symbol. And for two, uh, this is gonna be equal to 
one for x equals two plus minus one mod eight and minus one for plus minus three mod eight. So this is just some extension of uh, the Jacobi symbol. Uh, great. Okay, so once we declare that this factor, this square root factor is basically constant, we're facing a falling sum, the falling sum. So we're summing over n square three um, and n satisfying a conjugacy condition, let's say you know, minus p mod four, sum from one to infinity of minus p n on n divided by n. This is just the, the value of one of the cell function. Um, uh, and the idea is just to truncate so we can truncate at a pretty low cost um, this uh, Dirichlet series. And now we can use the greatest analytic number theory trick of all time, which is to switch the order of summation. And so we'll be summing, let's say for each n, we're summing over n. And so a Interval this thing. And now you can see we're in business. This is there's sort of two general cases. The first is that n is a square, in which case this is just a trivial character of module sun. The second case is that n is not a square, in which case expectedly there's a lot of cancellation. Um, so yeah, so we're summing, in both cases, we're summing something of the form mu, mu, mu squared of n, mu, mu squared of x, chi of x, for chi of either trivial or non-trivial. Um, we can use Perron's formula, um, which in this case, we'll be applying to something like ls chi, uh, 2s chi squared. Um, and when pi is trivial, there's going to be a pole. When pi is not trivial, there's not going to be a pole. And standard, let's say even the convexity bound for um, this Dirichlet L function will give a good enough error term. So we'll get an error term of size, let's say, x to the three fifths and m to the one fifth. Something very manageable. Um, yeah, so. This cancellation basically comes down to applying to using something like polyam number and everything works out easily. Okay. But now there's the much more annoying case. Which is that we also have a whole bunch of class numbers of the following form, k squared n squared minus 4pn divided by d squared. Um, so you, you assume y is bigger than square root x? So what is the shortest interval for this? Yeah, so, so that's why y can't be super short, because we won't get enough cancellation. Uh, probably square squared x will do it. But yeah, so y has to be trapped between uh, two powers of x less than 1. Okay, so now we have this thing, uh, which turns out to be much more interesting and turns out to be the source of all these bizarre constants uh, that I wrote down for you in the beginning. Uh, okay, how do we deal with that? So once again, up to getting rid of the main square root term, we're looking at something like uh, the sum over n's which goes up to the truncation parameter, the sum over d is going up to, let's say, k root x. And now, 
instead of summing over square free ends, satisfying just like a simple mod four condition, uh, we have a very weird, uh, we have a very weird uh, conjugacy. Uh, congruence. Congruence, sorry. Very weird congruence class condition. And we all allergic to congruence if you work with a trace form. Right. <laughs> and so the main source of the main source of annoyance of this congruence condition is that it actually is not sufficient to say that n has to satisfy something mod d squared. And the reason that that's not sufficient is because this class number formula works very well, but you have to uh, you can only apply it assuming that the thing you're plugging into the class number formula already satisfies the mod four condition. And when you start taking things of this form and dividing them through, it's very difficult to keep track of whether or not the resulting thing is zero, one, mod four, or or something else. So, uh, so okay. In the, in the case when when k is odd, everything works out pretty well. So. Let me just say this. So for k odd, this indeed turns out to just be like basically a, a mod d squared condition. But in the case of k even, uh, there's a lot of like weird combinatorics, for lack of a better word, um, that goes into this calculation. And the sort of miracle is that in the end, they both uh, give a very nice Euler product coefficient in both the even and the odd case. All right, so how do we do this? Um, let me just address uh, the case of k equals one because everything else is a more, more um, annoying version of the same thing. Uh, okay. So just like previously, Uh, just, just like previously, after manipulating this a little bit, uh, you can see that uh, we're looking at something of the form. Yeah, some over. Oh, maybe I should do After, after switching the order of summation, uh, for each n and d, we're, we're, we're looking at something uh, like this. OK, and if you remember, in, in the case when we're just looking at uh, pn on n, this was very difficult to deal with because we, we could have just said, Okay, if this is a square, it's trivial. If it's not a square, it's non-trivial, uh, and it's all good and well. Well, it turns out that in this case, we can't do that. And the reason that we can't do that is because when n, it, it can, so in case when, when we plug in this quadratic form at the top, uh, it is not the case. So the sum of x mod a of x, x minus 4p on n, uh, does not have to be equal to zero when n is square free. So for each n, the sum over all the residues uh, is going to give some constant depending on n. Um, and we kind of have to keep track of all these constants or otherwise we have no chance of getting the correct main term. Um, Uh, but the following works. So we can split this in three cases. The first case uh, is that n and d are small. And this gives a main term. And the way to do it in this case is to exploit directly equidistribution mod nd squared 
of these uh, square free numbers in the interval. And here you can see why both N and D have to be small because uh, the modulus that we need to do this in relation to is our product. Okay. And then uh, the second case is when D is still small and N is large. And here we can use Poisson summation, the Poisson summation trick. Uh, to show that this is going to be an error term. And lastly, when D is large, we just use a trivial bound on the class number to begin with. What is tau? Just a small explicit. Uh, tau is an explicit parameter that sort of moves around depending on the length of the interval that you chose to begin with. OK. Um, Let's see. I guess I, I don't have time to go into too much detail for each of those cases, uh, but let me just say, okay, so in this case, there's a theorem of Hooley that is strong enough to address this, which is that uh, if we pick a congruence class mod M and we count uh, square free numbers in this congruence class up to some parameter z, then this is going to be equal to an expected main term plus a very good error term. So plus with z over m plus. And here, the fact that there's this M in the denominator, um, yeah, it, it, it is what is what makes everything work out. So basically, just taking root Z might not necessarily be good enough. Okay, and with this theorem, the idea is now to take uh, this 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 entire sum and to break it into congruence classes mod n squared and d squared. Which have the correct congruence mod b squared. Um, take a a minus four p squared n um, times uh, whatever the theorem gives for the number of uh, square free integers in this interval that fall in the correct congruence class. So times some constant times y. Okay, so this is now a finite sum. This is a sum that depends on d and n. And if you play around with it for long enough, you can write this down as an explicit multiplicative function of n and d. And then you can just sum this function over all n's and d's. And at the end of the day, you'll get a main error term, which is going to look like c times y. This one is mu n squared or mu n? Squared, 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 squared. <laughs> um, Ready to have a main term with Mobius? Yeah. Uh, yeah, and the reason it keeps appearing is because, uh, so basically this observation about the this function, it, it works if you take all new forms of all levels as well. But in the case of n square free, this trace formula just simplifies very dramatically. Um, so I, I imagine you could, if you really wanted to, pull off doing all of this for n, for a general n, but I wouldn't want to do it. Uh, okay. So, we'll just very briefly say what happens in the second case. So n less than n greater than y to the tau and d less than y to the tau. Okay, the, the idea the idea is the following. Uh, the idea is to again uh, play around with the sum a little bit and to express it in roughly the following form up to an error term. 
so that the idea is to write it as some kind of smoothing function uh, times an n periodic function. Uh, and here, this n periodic function is going to be like a product of it, it's going to be a character in a quadratic form again. It's going to be something like this. And then once, once you express everything in this form, you can use uh, Poisson summation and arithmetic regressions to rewrite this as sum over the integers of x over n times m, b mod m. Okay, so the idea is to use Poisson summation to express this as something that has manageable decay times something that sort of only depends on uh, there's like a finite sum that you that you can then try to bound. Um, and then once you have it in this form, you can uh, you can get a savings. So for n sufficiently large. Uh, you can get a savings. And the, the savings will be, so, so the sort of the trivial bound uh, is of size y over d squared. And the savings that we get is something like a function m over n, which is expressible as, so if n is p1 alpha 1, pk alpha k with these odd, times a square, uh, then this function is going to be like the product of one over root pi's. So you can see why here we're sort of relying very heavily on n being large, because if n is small, we're, we're, we're getting no savings at all, um, which makes sense because when n is small, terms should be contributing to the main term. OK, and, and the last step is to just notice that luckily, when you sum this over n and d, this goes to zero um, as parameters go to infinity. So this is a main term. Yeah, and, and lastly, like I said, in, in the last case, when d is large, we just use z equals bound on the class number and everything works out. OK, so hopefully I've convinced you that this is very doable once you start with a trace formula. And now I just want to take um, a couple of minutes to talk a little bit about this function because uh, this function turns out to be really cool. So instead of mm -hmm. square p level, we just use a prime level. Uh-huh. Would um, change simpler? I'm, I'm sure the answer would change. I don't know if it's necessarily simpler because um, sort of trying to trap primes in congruence classes is arguably more difficult than doing that with square free numbers. Uh, but I, I'm sure it works. But I'm also sure that the answer is that the constants are all different. OK, so there, let me remind you that this is the resulting function. So the cool property of this function that I am now trying to understand rigorously is that it seems to be uh, self-similar on a quadratic scale. Uh, so these are three plots. This one is from uh, four squared to five squared. This one is from uh, 10 squared to 11 squared. And this one is from, uh, what does it have to be? 31 squared to 32 squared, exactly. Uh, and if, if, you look, if you look at it very carefully, you might notice that they're very similar looking, except they start to expand a little bit in the y direction. Um, and I think with enough, uh, if you play around with it for long enough, you'll, you'll be able to see, or I'll be able to see hopefully, um, that this function is genuinely asymptotically periodic. Um, it, it seems to be true from preliminary calculations. Asymptotically periodic is a function of y squared, so you have to change the scale um, a little bit. And of course, another thing that stands out is that this function seems to change sign infinitely often. In fact, 
seems to change time twice between every, sorry, four times between every, no, twice, four times between every pair of squares. I guess squares over four are also relevant. Um, so yeah, and then if you take this function and integrate it, say over a dyadic interval, you will be able to recover the original thing that we were looking for um, with very good error terms. All right, I think that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Yeah. Can you also use a roller picture formula like here's the formula to compute it? Uh, yeah, so I should have pointed this out. So if you use the Peterson formula, you get a different result. And crucially, um, for small primes, this bias basically disappears. Uh, but yeah, as, as the prime becomes, so, so here this bias was sort of existent and of, of size squared n, uh, even when you fix the prime, like just take p equals two and start varying the level, you, you, you get something of size squared n in the bias. But if you do it with harmonic weights, then you, you don't you get something of size one. So do you have the weights one over, um, like like the adjoint function value that you want? Huh? Do you have the a weight? That's what you so, yeah, yeah. So uh, by harmonic weights, I mean if, if you can, do the you can also remove it. You you could, yeah. Uh, but does that simplify this uh, this calculation? So even without removing the weights, uh -huh. using the Peterson formula was much more difficult much more than difficult. this, I think. Uh, okay. Um, because here there's sort of there's no Bessel functions. There's nothing you have to deeply worry about. Okay, there are Bessel functions, but in a different way. Um, but yeah, presumably you could, but the fact that, it, that there's just no bias for small primes means that maybe you can only do it for P sufficiently large, like for P of size N, or I guess the advantage of it is that you can do it for P much larger than N, like N to some power bigger than two, yes. whereas here you can't. Um, Those weights smooth it out just like the naive ordering screws out the elliptic curve, the phenomenon disappears completely. It's not there for P up to N. If you put in those weights, they, they tend to smooth out the whole, this function is not smooth, it's periodic. I mean, it's gonna be called the Zubrilina function. <laughs> a very basic function in the subject clearly. And it's uh, continuous, but not differentiable. Well, if you try to do it the other way, I think you won't see it. It's, it's, and if you try to move the weights, you would have to come, you'd have to get the class numbers back. Yeah, and I guess it's, it's non-differentiable in a very obvious way because every time you cross a point k squared over four, you're suddenly adding basically a square y. In fact, this is very much the dogma that the relative trace formula is the right one to use all the time is actually wrong here. It's the exact opposite. The trace formula picks this up and not the Peterson. So uh, it's kind of remarkable. So I'm curious about, you know, you, you proved the statement about the family of all modular forms, which in the dyadics set, uh, setting here would have size about n squared. Mm -hmm. And this family of elliptic curves there has size about n to five six, presumably. Um, so I would have thought that just the random fluctuations in that would have, as n gets large, overwhelmed this term. Is, is that uh, the case? Sorry, could you repeat that? So you have like a main term for this big thing of size n squared, yeah. but you're picking out inside it as some subset of size n to the five six. Right. Um, and so I would have thought that this main term sort of like gets washed out by the noise as n gets larger. Is that what one sees experimentally? Uh, for for m getting larger, you have to ask Drew. But I but I guess in the pictures that I was showing earlier, you certainly do see much more noise um, in this picture. Uh, I see. But it does still look. Yeah. Okay. No, it would be like an end to the one twelve kind of phenomenon. So mm -hmm. I guess hypothetically, one could, could try to compute the variance and, okay. and try to predict. Yeah. What sort of picture you would expect when you sample like that? Okay. Any more questions? Okay.
Okay, let's like, leave it again.